You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. Then you would say welcome. All right. <laughs> Would I? Yeah. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 4, page 4. <laughs> I am your belated host, Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome, everybody. <coughs> and that's our production assistant, R080T. Announcer man, at your service. And the announcer man. So the story for today is... Verses on St. Andrews by Berrien C. Henderson. Berrien Henderson lives with his family in southeast Georgia. He was born in a small town and currently lives in a farming community. Deer and turkey have been known to wander through his yard. A small cadre of common house geckos earns their keep by eating the bugs on the carport and front porch. Both Barry and his wife teach high school English, and sixth grade English, respectively. He has a son and a daughter, and they both answer to Thing 1 and Thing 2. He spends his ever-elusive free time with family and late in the evening or late at night writing speculative fiction and poetry. Verses on St. Andrews first appeared in The Spinning Whirl, number 2, in 2006. We'd like to thank Liz Mirzievsky and Julie Hoverson for lending their voices to today's episode. Some sound effects were provided by freesound.org, and today's music is Winter Princess by Zero Project. You can check out the links in the show notes. Verses on St. Andrews by Berrien C. Henderson One. At 6396 St. Andrew Street lives a witch. She likes giving hard candy treats to boys foolish enough to step across the ivy-tangled bower at the head of the flagstone walkway to her house. The witch lurks behind faded curtains adorning sad glassed windows in a colonial home marked with a patina of green mold on cream siding. Each day her jade eyes leer at feeling as she mutters word glamour and fashions arcane symbols in the stale air of her home. Feeling's mother had given him a pouch for protection because he always walked down St. Andrews to go to school. He could sense the weight of her spells upon him, then the gust of wind which would dissipate her fell magic. Thankful for his mother's pouch, Feeling would hurry along. But the pouch would not protect him from a fall off the monkey bars, nor the pug-faced, buck-toothed man-child slug, who teased feeling about the shock of white hair at his widow's peak. Perhaps someday, but not now. He could only open the pouch once, and only once, so help him, under the direst of circumstances. That was the rule. Poisoned hard candy from the witch on St. Andrews doesn't constitute an emergency, said feeling's mother. Then what does? You'll know when the time comes, she replied cryptically, smacking a heart-shaped cookie cutter on a sheet of sugar cookie dough. Besides, you don't have to accept others' gifts, nor invite them into your world. Invitations have power. She smacked the cookie cutter down again. Remember, feeling, she said. He had asked his mother once whether or not the pouch was magical. She denied it on grounds that that would make her a witch. Then what does that make you? Feeling had asked. Clever. She had laughed, <laughs> kissing him on the forehead and rumpling his hair. His white lock fluffed up. She kissed him again. Go on and do your homework. I'll be along when I'm done. She said. Are we going to read? He hoped so. Of course. In his room, Feeling sat at an old roll-top desk his mother had bought at an auction. She had made him help strip the old varnish and refinish it. The bottoms of the drawers had cedar panels in them and maintained that dry, sweet aroma that spoke of calm to Feeling. 
On top of the desk perched a reading lamp with its curiously crooked neck and cyclopean eye bulb glaring down. When he sat down, his chair creaked in acceptance of his weight, while he leafed through his language arts notebook and found the portfolio for his poetry project. He'd already found four of the requisite five poems, any length, any subject, and had gone so far as to cut and paste them with clip art, ten extra points for visuals. A lamb and tiger, an eagle on a cliffside, a snake parting shin-high grass. One more he'd let his mother help with tonight. When his bedroom door opened, it whispered over the shag carpet. Barefooted, his mother eased across the room into Feeling's desk, where he pored over his poetry portfolio. How goes it? She said, placing her warm hand on his shoulder and patting it. Feeling shrugged. Fine. I just need one more poem, and I don't know what to put. She accepted the folder from him and leafed through it, smiling at the clip art he'd interspersed among the selections. Hmm. Frost. Blake. And Blake, she said. My teacher said that companion poems count as individual entries, said Feeling. Nice of her to do that. Tennyson. An eyebrow arched. I'm impressed. I like eagles, you know that, said Feeling. Still need another poem. His mother walked over to Feeling's nightstand and the small bookshelf beside it. She pulled out a little blue cloth-bound hardcover with a red ribbon place marker. Collected Works of Emily Dickinson. Let's try this one, Feeling. Ms. Dickinson is always good for inclusion in a poetry project. She wrote about the fly, right? And many other creatures, including death. Why write about death? She grew up by a cemetery. What would you write about? She thumbed through the edition and stopped. Let's try this one. Witchcraft has not a pedigree. Feeling listened closely as his mother plucked words off the paper and hung them in the air. He smiled and nodded, asking her to read some more poems, but deciding to copy the first. If you don't mind, I'd like to borrow this collection and read myself to sleep, Feeling. She said. That's fine, Mother. Thank you for helping me find what I needed. Said Feeling as she bent down and kissed the white shock of hair at his widow's peak. He stood and walked her to the door and watched her glide down the hallway and back into the living room. Yawning, Mm. Feeling shook his head and plodded back to the roll-top desk and shut off the reading lamp, then trudged to bed. Verses dangled in his mind as his head hit the pillow, and his thoughts bounded to stresses and rhythms he wouldn't know for several years to come. He didn't know they were iams. Tetrameter would be alien. Lines tumbled through his dozing head and stuck together, and feeling dreamed of snakes and bees and nobody. In his sleep, feeling smiled and hummed. Three. Fridays are pizza day at Cochrane Elementary. So grow the children, so grows the community. Most weeks, Feeling takes an extra 50 cents to school so that he can buy a second slice of pizza, which he sneaks into his backpack. In order to conceal the smell, he brings a Ziploc bag. Feeling furthers his clandestine culinary endeavors by spiriting the pizza to second recess, the one at the end of the day, right before pickup by parents and buses, or the walk home for some. Usually he sits under the old pecan tree in the playground's far corner where solitude and two-hour-old pizza dovetail. Then the obligatory trip to the monkey bars. But today, slug, pug-faced and buck-toothed, has come to school with a black eye and blacker temper. He has been quiet, like the space between heartbeats or the Euclidean line between the primer and the powder. He did not eat last night, nor did he eat lunch today. Slug's gray eyes scan the playground and find two victims, together, under the old pecan tree. Hey, faggot, says Slug, looming before Feeling. The epithet stings. Feeling knows what it means, knows it is merely a colorful tactic to provoke him. Low words, emotional words. Feeling's mother has instructed him. Nothing more than the rusted tools of the lowest fumblers of language. Feeling reaches down, absently brushing the useless pouch. A proven thing. It dispels the rumor of the witch's magic. 
it fails against the reality of playground politics. Puffing himself up like an adder, Slug says, I want that goddamn piece of pizza. So, feeling stands. He will regret the decision. It would be, though, the last time Slug ever attempts to take from feeling, and the last day he would ever antagonize the boy. You want the pizza? Says feeling, his voice impassive. The breeze tussles his hair and puffs at the white lock birthmark. Slug's eyes flash greedily. Yeah, shunkhead. He thrusts out a paw-like hand with grimy fingernails. His long sleeve hikes up, and Feeling sees the angry spot, a circular crater scabbed over and ringed pinkish. And Feeling's heart becomes smaller for his having seen the ugliness done to Slug. Yet he struggles against the complimentary ugliness being brought against him. Slug is becoming what was done him. Feeling drops the pizza in the dirt and grinds it with his heel. He tingles from the exuberance of the act. He feels a breath of lightheadedness. This is what no feels like, he thinks, grinning at Slug. The man-child rushes him, trounces him to the carpet of pecan leaves. His rage is wordless, a snarling thing as he straddles Feeling's chest and pins his arms to the ground with his knees. Eat this! Slug hisses, grabbing a handful of crackly pecan leaves and summarily shoving them into Feeling's mouth. And as suddenly, Slug dismounts the boy because a teacher has noticed something on the fringes of the playground. Once Feeling stands, sputtering and spitting leaf bits from his mouth, Slug cuts him with his eyes, and in that heavy-lidded stare, Feeling sees emptiness. Bell rings soon, he says. Run, I'll still beat hell out of you. All because of pizza? Says Feeling, spitting once more. You should have never stood up, faggot. Slug saunters away, tugging at the cuffs of his long sleeves. The bell to go back inside rings. Feeling knows he has ten minutes to develop a strategy for surviving the trip home. He has seen the anger of Slug, experienced it firsthand like so many of the other children at school. But today is different for two reasons. Feeling has stood up to the boy and denied him the satisfaction of easy victory. And today, Feeling has seen Slug's darkness. The boy's eyes changed colors, from flint-cold irises to the space between stars. Four. The shortest distance between two points is a line. So began the mantra as Feeling's bouncing backpack kept counterpoint rhythm with his hurried footsteps. The shortest distance between two points is a line. He surveyed the deserted street. Fallen leaves scraped over the sidewalk, and the headlights of parallel parked cars stared in catatonia through Feeling. The shortest distance between two points is a line. He reached the 6,000 block of St. Andrew's Street, four blocks from home. The specter of Slug's threat hovered over him. Slug would, in essence, have to go half a dozen blocks out of his way to intercept Feeling, who did not discount the promise made him. Long-armed, loping Slug appeared on the corner behind Feeling. The boy picked up his pace. A line... Slug's worn boots scudded the cracked sidewalks and broke Granny's backs with each inevitable step. Line. Then it struck feeling, a wash of vertigo. Two points. Two. Points. The mantra had fragmented, and dizziness nipped at the fringes of feeling's mind. Absently, his hand dipped to the pouch tucked in his back pocket. He looked behind him, then beside him. He stopped and stared at the specter of the ivy-fringed bower with its tongue of wobble-down flagstones running back to the red-brown brick steps of 6396 St. Andrew Street. A dirty curtain moved back into place surreptitiously. Feeling knew the witch had cast a spell at him, but the pouch had befuddled her magic. Oh no, don't stop now, not while it's getting good, taunted Slug. A shiver insinuated itself through feeling as he decided to enter the witch's property. He sprinted to the front porch steps and waited for Slug, who advanced interminably like some automaton. Feeling pulled the pouch from his pocket and gripped it, knowing it useless against Slug. 
but already sensing it repel another round of glamour tickling his back. Slug stopped at the edge of the yard. Come here. Feeling shook his head. You come here. The boys stared at each other. It wasn't lost on Slug that Feeling stood firmly entrenched on the witch's property. The only thing Slug feared was his father, not some crazed-ass shut-in folks called a witch. He advanced. Then he tripped on some sunken flagstones, and as he scuttled to his feet, creepers detached themselves from the trunks of the oak trees dimming the yard from the sharp lances of afternoon sunlight. Fluttering leaves mutter rasped Ophidian warnings. The bower trembled as the ivy vine slithered lightning fast along the ground and seized Slug's ankles. He grunted and tugged, but more vines caught him and lifted him several feet off the ground. Eldritch spells seeped over feeling and towards Slug. He blanched as the vines jerked Slug back and forth like demented arms cradling a baby to sleep. A vine wrapped around Slug's mouth, muffling a string of curse words. Equal parts fear and rage gleamed in Slug's eyes as he stared at Feeling. Both of you are trespassing, came a soft voice. The witch materialized from the shadows of an azalea hedge along the edge of the porch. Feeling reached down and clenched his pouch. And I wouldn't worry about that, said the witch, pointing a slender finger at Feeling's pouch. Her raven tresses shimmered in the dappled sunlight filtering through the canopy of oak limbs. Cold green eyes appraised the thrashing form of Slug. She glanced only briefly at Feeling, rooted to the front steps. The witch stopped midway between Feeling and Slug. With practiced, effortless finger gestures, she signed in the air and mumbled under her breath. The vines tightened. Slug whimpered. What are you doing? Asked Feeling. What does it look like? Hurting him. Isn't that what you want me to do, boy? Said the witch, grinning at Feeling. He shook his head. Something cold and heavy bloomed in Feeling's stomach. No! Yet you came onto my property knowing that I can't do a thing to you. Correct? Feeling set his jaw. Now that I have him... Your problem is solved, she said, waggling her fingers at Slug. Another whimper. The front of Slug's pants darkened with urine. I thought he wouldn't follow me, said Feeling, desperate now that Slug was hurting. He didn't want this. He didn't. I only wanted to be left alone, the witch snarled at Feeling. Funny, that's all I've wanted since I've lived here, and just when I think I've got the whole damn community convinced it's not worth breathing past my place, you two roosters come strutting onto my property with your problems spilling over into my space. Feeling wished he couldn't see Slug hitching with sobs that wouldn't come out. The boy's hands were beginning to purple from the vines constricting his wrists, and Feeling imagined the same thing was happening to Slug's feet. He thought he smelled excrement now and felt greasy inside. He never wanted it to come to this. A wave of glamour washed over him, rocking him on his heels, and the pouch warmed from soaking up magic. He drew some comfort from the witches having no power over him, but she convicted him with those slivered green eyes. I know this boy likes to hurt you and other children, said the witch. I've seen it, right, boy? She turned to Slug and walked over to him and took his chin between her thumb and fingers to force him to look at her. You are a torturer of cats, said the witch. That too I have seen, and they have told me. Muffled words came from Slug, whose eyes glazed over with a thousand-yard stare to insulate him from her words. He would have spit on her if he could. His embarrassment renewed his vigor, and he thrashed more vehemently. A new vine crept along Slug's back and caressed his throat while the witch studied him. Cold sweat and panic gripped feeling as he watched the vine slink loosely around Slug's throat. You'll know when the time comes, came his mother's words. Let him go, said feeling. No. Please! Your problem became my problem. The pouch turned leaden in Feeling's hands. 
He opened it while the witch focused her signs and muttering on slug. Inside the pouch lay a slip of worn paper, folded and closed with a piece of transparent tape. On one side was written in his mother's hand, Open and read aloud to her. Feeling broke the tape, opened the paper, and studied the words. He cleared his throat. Then... Water is taught by thirst, land by the ocean's past, transport by throw, peace by its battles told, love by the memorial mold, birds by the snow. The witch stopped in mid-mumble and turned to face feeling. She walked up to him and tried snatching the poem from his hand. But a gust of wind accomplished the task for her and whisked the paper out of her yard to skid along the sidewalk with a smattering of leaves. Like a curious puppy cocking its head askance, the witch stared unblinking a moment at feeling. She lifted a hand to sign a spell at him, but dropped it, knowing the pouch would stay her efforts. Behind her, the vine suddenly relaxed and dropped slug with a whoop on the flagstones, and the boy jumped up running. At the sidewalk, he turned briefly and shouted, You bitch, I hope you burn in hell! Sniffing rivulets of snot from his nose, he loped down the sidewalk as fast as he could. Feeling's lips moved wordlessly, repeating the lines of the poem, the one his mother often read to him at night. He thought of the small cloth-bound hardcover of collected poems, and he had marked that poem down. He didn't understand all of it, but he understood enough. Sometimes, to know a thing, we need to see its opposite, drifted his mother's wisdom. Her name was Emily, and she understood. Peace by its battles told, whispered Feeling, stepping forward. Get off my property now, boy, said the witch through clenched teeth. Feeling walked off the front porch, and the witch drifted aside. He felt a breath of magic sidle up to him, as she attempted one last spell. The pouch throbbed in Feeling's hand. Peace by its battles told, he repeated, walking the bumpy flagstones to the sidewalk. The vines reared up and whipped at him to form a writhing, verdant mesh barrier. Come in for some juice and candy, lilted the witch. Please, I... I forgive you. She sauntered toward Feeling, and her features smoothed away years with each step until she could have been twenty years old, mouth slightly open, tongue peeking between rows of pearls. Her midnight hair seemed to push her cheekbones higher, mold them into sharp knobs below those jade eyes. No, ma'am. If he didn't accept her invitation, he would be all right. She couldn't touch him with her magic, but could tempt him with her words. And beauty like the night. Soothingly, she said, I was too harsh. Please, a boy of your talent deserves something. To be left alone, feeling drew a deep breath. I think I understand now. Her green eyes galvanized. This is the most I've talked to anyone in years. Contemptuous laughter fluttered through the air, and the seasons rippled in quick silver runnels over her face, until its uncanny, older handsomeness returned. I'm leaving. Fury churned the witch's face. I protected you from that boy! Ingrate! I apologize for using your property to scare Slug. Yet you helped him! Frown lines writhed like snakes between her eyebrows. You were hurting him. I have watched you too, boy. Seen you seeing me behind my curtains. Felt my spells fade the moment they touched you. That doesn't happen. Chewing her lower lip, she said, Well, I suppose it does now. The vines fell to the ground and retreated to the bower and the tree trunks. Go. Study the words taught you. They are powerful said the witch. Feeling watched her vanish in a blade of sunlight. The witch's voice floated to Feeling as he stepped onto the sidewalk. I'll still be watching. In the evening's fading glamour, 
Feeling hurried home, and the pouch lightened the farther he got from 6396 St. Andrews Street. He saw the notes scuttle and pinwheel with the breeze along the asphalt, while lingering echoes of verse scattered themselves among autumn leaves. Author's note. This is Barry and C. Henderson providing you with some story background for verses on St. Andrews. The story began with the first sentence looping through my head one day when I drove home from work. Once I made it home, I wrote the first few paragraphs complete with the protagonist's name, feeling, rolling through the old brain pan. The initial concept clarified easily enough. Boy deals with a bully, encounters a witch, and learns a lesson. Now, the lesson itself wasn't all that clear until the character Slug showed up, ready to bully Feeling out of that slice of pizza. That Feeling was self-aware enough to know he'd never be able to defend himself physically from Slug was clear, along with his own understanding of his protection from the witch's magic, and that Slug lacked such protection himself. And with that decision came feeling suffering any authority whatsoever once he passively aggressively lured Slug onto the witch's property. Other than that, the story unspooled structurally in the many chapters. It's almost cliche to say the story wrote itself, and that would be rather convenient to relate right now, wouldn't it? But it would be a lie. No, it wasn't until a few days after I'd begun the story gave it some room to breathe, because I had other stories going, and had written enough for the place holding, as it were, that I had ordered some daily takeout, and while waiting, did do the most cliched thing in the world. I wrote some stuff down on a napkin. Still have the napkin, by the way. You never know when you'll need a years old written upon napkin. It all boiled down to that pouch, the conundrum waiting to happen, and I felt it was too obtuse in and of itself. So, Feeling's mom put some mysterious something in the pouch. So what? Well, that so what ended up being what was there all along, the poetry. At the time, I'd been brushing up on Miss Dickinson's poems, and it sl- seemed a slam dunk. The juxtaposing of big physical bully and quiet little kid emerged, then the mother figure and the antithetical mother figure in Feeling's mom as a nurturer, and the witch as temptress. The story story had its binaries, so to speak. It was my slow animal brain finally catching up. That's when the Dickinson poem, Water is Taught by Thirst, showed up and helped this writer out. That's really the hinge pin holding the story together, that slip of paper in that magic-absorbing pouch, and feeling's ultimate lesson in the consequences of his actions. You know what movie they need to remake? What? Mannequin. Oh, that would be awesome. I loved Mannequin. Did you really? Well, I thought Kim Cattrall was hot back in those days, but that was a long time ago after all. But I did like the movie. I don't know. So, Oh, welcome back, everybody. Yes, yes, welcome. So they're doing Steve Audio Vision. Uh, no, we already did that. Welcome back. Ah. Uh, they just enjoyed the story and uh, had a good time. We've been gone for a long time. Did we explain? Yes, we did explain the whole computer meltdown thing, didn't we? Yeah, we did. The computer meltdown. Yeah, this whole episode, as a matter of fact, was already recorded once before. And here we are doing it again because my hard drive died completely. And we lost the wonderful chat we had about this story the first time around. And yes, speaking of remakes, the original was better. (laughs) Good stuff. So let me see if I can remember what I asked you the first time we did this episode. It was something along the lines of, how is it that we're just barely now getting to verses on St. Andrews? That story was sent to us. I don't remember a time when we didn't have this story. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's been at least since like June of last year. I always feel bad 
whenever we have something like this happen. This story was originally handed to one person to edit and then something didn't work out and they couldn't do it. So it went to someone else. And in the end, I wound up doing it myself. It was one of those things. Uh, hopefully, Barian doesn't hate us for having uh, taken so friggin' long. It's just the way life goes, unfortunately. You know, it's possible that it's been so long that he wouldn't even think to check our site anymore to see if it's gone up. <laughs> It'd be like you sent a story to a magazine, never heard back, and then, you know, three years later, you're at a newsstand. Are there newsstands anymore? And there's your story. Yeah, he probably um, has forgotten that we even accepted this story. He's probably resubmitted it somewhere else, I bet. Well, people can do that, right? He can do that. I, yeah, he could. Okay, so so uh, have we apologized to Barry? Sorry, Barry. Well, a simple yes would have sufficed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. And we tried for a long time. We tried to get the uh, the response time down. The uh, wait time, that's one of the reasons that we closed submissions for so long, was just so that we could catch up and we would be able to avoid this unfortunate thing uh, that Barry is going through and that many of the people have gone through. Yeah, we definitely were full up, as they say. Yeah, it took us a long time to work through that backlog of accepted stories that just weren't getting done. But, uh, you know, I think it's time I think it's time to open up the floodgates again, open up the doors and allow folks to uh, to send their work our way. And we'll, we'll give it a, a look-see again. What do you think of that? Well, yeah, I, I believe we told people initially that it would be 2010. Yeah. And so people assumed that meant January 1st, but we weren't ready. We Holy cow. We're still loaded up until what? June or July with stories? Yeah, something like that. Um, and then somebody somewhere said, okay, April. We'll open again. And then we had the whole computer loss meltdown thing. And meltdown is a cool word <laughs> because it can mean like an emotional freak out. It can also mean a, a nuclear thing. And then which we're both involved in this particular event. So we will reopen submissions really soon. Should I just arbitrarily say next episode we will reopen submissions? Is that fair? OK, that works for me. But in the meantime, I, I thought it would be fun if we could uh, I, I don't, just have like a question and answer session. Uh, you know, I I've always like when people send us comments or people send us questions uh, or when people send us money. I like that a lot. I thought it would be neat if we just opened ourselves up for questions. Somebody could send us a question and then in a, an upcoming episode, maybe next week's, but probably not because we're so behind, we'd just sit down and we would answer the questions. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like, you know, how did you two first meet or which Supreme Court justice would you most like to have sex with? It, it, it can be any kind of question. Would you be up for that if, if the listener sent us a, a, a couple of questions and we just answered them at the end of an episode? I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time getting the Supreme Court justice image out of my mind. It's the black robes, isn't it? What were you saying again? Am I good with that? Yeah, that, that should be fine. Okay. Good, good. So if you have a question, send it our way, editor at doonsteef.com, and we will put that question and we'll put them all in a big list and we'll just try and answer them all in, in an upcoming episode here. So we'll do that. And then uh, starting next episode, instead of this episode, you can uh, start submitting your stories. But while we're talking about that, if you would like to read submissions and help us narrow those down a little bit. Send us an email over at editor at doonsteef.com and just say, hey, I'd like to volunteer to be a, a reader. Is that what they're called? Yeah, I think the uh, industry term is slush reader. You read the slush pile. You know, I've always felt like slush was a pejorative word. Oh, yeah? Yes, I am pretending I know what that word means because smart people use it. Oh. But it, I, maybe it's not. Maybe slush just means incoming submissions, incoming art. And I've just always assumed that it's a negative thing. Yeah, I always thought it was kind of a negative thing too, but what else you call it? Submission. Oh, uh, <clears throat> okay. If you would like to be a submissions pile reader, then drop us an email. Editor at doomsteep.com. And uh, while we're asking people uh, if you'd like to help us with voices, 
if you would like to help us with producing episodes, which is getting people to do the characters and editing it and maybe putting music and sound effects underneath it for us. If you would like to help in that way, uh, if you'd like to produce some kind of art for each episode, or we we missed a few episodes there when we didn't do any art. And lately, Big has been doing them himself. And actually, they're really, really cool. But if you're an artist and you'd like to take that off our hands, that would be awesome. Editor at doingsteve.com. Is there anything else that we need help with? Well, since we're asking for stuff, we might as well ask for donations while we're at it, too. Um, if you find that the Dune Steve audio fiction magazine is something that you value, something that you really enjoy, and you would like to keep it going. We pay our authors, so you know we need to uh, have something to pay them with. So if you feel so inclined, on our website there is a button on the right side of the screen, PayPal donation buttons. It gives you several different choices you can pick. You can donate five bucks a quarter, five bucks a month, or just pick your own amount to donate. Yeah, if you feel so inclined, hop on over there and press the button. That never not gets old. <laughs> um, okay, so back to uh, Verses on St. Andrews. Oh, yeah, that's right. I love, and I've always loved, stories about the old woman that lives at the end of the block that's a witch. Or, you know, the house that's three blocks over that's haunted or you know, uh-huh. the, the, this is a place with the history, you know, the, the abandoned waste processing plant on the hill, those kind of things. And uh, yeah, sorry, that was uh, <laughs> something that I really dug about this story and, and I can't get enough of them. You know, it's sort of a, uh, a tenant of small town life where everybody knows everybody else. Everybody knows where the bad person lives or lived. Uh huh. Was that the case with you growing up? Well, I didn't live in a small town, so it wasn't so much that way. When I was really little, late 70s and even barely going into the 80s, there was still a little bit of that, you know, everybody knew everybody else kind of vibe going on. I don't know if I can remember if there was ever a creepy house or something like that. There was, you know, like vacant lots that we played in and kids tried to scare each other. with, Oh, I saw something over there in the vacant lot or out in the park or whatever. But I don't know that I ever had a haunted house to grow up with when I was a kid. It's kind of sad. Did you live in the suburbs? Where every house is the same. Yeah, I did. Yeah, that's kind of the area that I lived in. It was a big subdivision that kind of all went up at the same time. And yeah, I don't know. There wasn't so many run down kind of old type places like that. Well, maybe you don't get old abandoned houses and all that stuff in that sort of environment. You're rambling again, guys. An interesting thing about this story You know, it has those kind of, that element, like it has the witch that lives down the street, which is a pretty common horror trope, or whatever you want to call it. I don't really know what trope means. That's kind of another one of those smart people words. Yeah, that, and and another thing that you see a lot in stories is, uh, you know, a kid who is bullied, and then he turns the tables on that bully. And the thing that I really liked about this story the thing that made it jump out to me and made me want to have it on the show was that, sure, it had these things in it, but it took the men, twisted them around in a different way than you expected. The bully, you know, that beat up on this kid. First of all, we get to know slightly who this bully is and why he's become a bully. And you realize that he's not necessarily a bad person, but his circumstances are making his life the way it is and so when feeling turns the tables on this bully you don't necessarily want this witch to kill the bully or or whatever it is that the witch may do to this bully you don't really want it to happen and i was really glad to see when feeling actually went out and saved this bully instead of uh, letting his plan go through to fruition and this witch did whatever she wanted with the bully and and also you know we talked about the witch i really liked that this witch was not your standard old crony spooky rich doing his old woman voice type witch 
Instead, this witch was some sort of a temptress. You know, she was sexy and beautiful and and she was trying to lure feeling in 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 that sort of a way and instead of in that creepy kind of a way yeah i think when we had julie do the voice uh we asked her hey make sure you don't do the typical witch voice on this try and be attractive and alluring and i you know i don't think that that's something uh, she has difficulty with (laughs) true enough She's got a voice that is worth listening to. It seems like there's a lot of those kind of, again, I want to say the word tropes, and I still don't know what it means, but it seems like there's a lot of tropes like that out there. You know, the other day I watched a movie. uh, It was called Lars and the Real Girl. Okay. Sorry, what? I was going to say the first time we had this conversation, I mistakenly said, oh, I've seen that, but I won't this time. And this movie is about a guy who is going a little nuts and he has decided that he will order himself one of those life-sized sex dolls. It's not like just a blow-up doll. Um, This is like a realistic, anatomically correct, uh, life-sized sex doll. And he orders one of these off of the internet and it comes in the mail and then he's just like, he starts treating this girl this sex doll as though she's real all his family and his friends and so forth are a little freaked out by this as you would expect but the interesting thing was you know i kept expecting for the a-holes to come along and make fun of him or break his doll to pieces or whatever in front of his eyes or, or something like that. You expect that. Maybe it's because I grew up in the 80s and that happened in all the movies in the 80s. I don't know. But uh, I just kept waiting for that to happen, I guess, because it's the trope of the uh, the genre. Is there a genre of sex doll movies? I'm sure there is a subgenre of those, but... <laughs> Yeah, you... But it's the trope that you kind of expect to happen in one of these kind of films. And instead, they never went there. I thought it was so great. It was so refreshing that they kept showing the people that lived in the town with this guy being supportive of him and doing their best to help him through the time of him being nutso and thinking this doll was a real girl. And... It was just really refreshing. It was just a different kind of film than you're used to. And the tropes of the various genres and so forth, they get established because those things work. Those things speak to people. But they can become tired, and it's cool to see them turned on their heads every now and then, and you get something different, like Versus on St. Andrews or like Lars and the Real Girl. You know, I think uh, one time I, I told you that... And now it's time for Tell Me a Story, Mommy, with Rish Outfield. Oh, now, if if you don't know me, I grew up in the smallest little town imaginable. You know, we walked to school and walked home from school, and when I was in, let's say, first grade... There was this house where an old man lived, and every kid in first grade said, you would need to stop at his house on the way home from school because he gives kids candy. <laughs> and I, yes, you laugh, but that was just something like, really? Why? Why would he give people candy? And there's like, well, he's magic or something. I mean, I, who knows <laughs> what the motivation was for us kids. But I remember yeah, going an extra block out of my way to stop at this old guy's house. And he had a big bowl like you would for Halloween that always had candy in it. And as we were walking home, you know, he would hand it out to kids. And uh, I guess in defense of how small and idyllic this community was, there was never any foul play or ulterior motives going on. Uh, you know, it wasn't until years later that uh, anyone even mentioned that this sort of thing might have a dark side or, or, or any of that stuff. It was just right. a nice man who genuinely liked children and maybe he was lonely and, uh, you know, he just wanted to do something nice. And, and yeah, I just uh, right. I, I can't remember how I tied it into the story the first time I told you this, but do you remember anything like that? I don't remember that. Do you remember me telling you the story? That does sound familiar. Because we we started talking about razor blades and apples and 
you know, yeah. some old lady down the block who bakes cookies for everybody for Halloween. And you're just like, you will not eat that. That's going in. That's not even going into the garbage can. That's going into the toilet. You know, just <laughs> how times have changed so much. Yeah. But um, maybe maybe that's not applicable at all <laughs> in this. It's just it seems like in today's day, you would be very wary of somebody, especially a man, because let's face it. It's never the dirty old woman. It's always the dirty old man. Yeah, if somebody's going to do violence, it's usually going to be a man that I think it may have to do with the whole upper body strength musculature that we have on our side. Speak for yourself. Yeah, way back then, even like I said, you know, I grew up in the suburbs, um, but we would have done the same thing if there was some nice old man who gave out candy. It wasn't until several years after that that the whole, you know, don't take candies from strangers kind of a thing became such a big deal that, you know, little kids can recite these cliches, I guess you would call them. I don't know. You know, that was way back before the razor blades and apples and the cyanide and the Tylenol bottles and all that that the world has inflicted upon us. And now if you're an old, lonely man who wants to do nice things to kids, well, you're effing out of luck. You're not allowed. I remember reading not too long ago, somebody was talking about how, how sad it's gotten where you're at a park with your kid, especially if you're a man, and you see some kid who's lost who can't find his mom or whatever, if you go over and help that kid and maybe take him to talk to a policeman or whatever, the first thing they're going to assume is that somehow you have stolen this kid, that you are the kidnapper. And then they'll make you prove that the child that actually is yours is really yours. It's gotten to the point where everybody's a suspect, no matter how good your intentions are. It's kind of sad. It's just the way life is, I guess. That's why I wear a hockey mask and a butcher's apron whenever I'm out in public. Just to clear up any suspicions of you being a good guy in the end? You know, you, that it's just too much trouble. Be sure to splatter some red paint on the apron before you head out. Uh huh? All right, so I guess that's uh, what we've got to say today. One other thing that I was thinking that we ought to mention to everybody before we go our way. Do take candy from strangers, kids. <laughs> yes, please. Or do you it. mean something besides that? Uh, something else, actually. Recently, I don't know what it was that moved me to do this, but I signed up the Doonesty for an account on Twitter. Oh, no. Yes. We're the last one. We were the last holdouts. Now that we've signed up, Twitter doesn't even have a sign-up button because, uh, yeah, we were all that was left in the world. So I signed us up for an account, and you can get on there and follow the Dune Steve on Twitter if you would like. We are on there at... I believe it's www.twitter.com forward slash Dune Steve. Wow. I, I, I would never go there myself. I'm just, you know, it's one of those things. I guess. You know, I would never lend a helping hand if there was a drowning victim. But if you would like to learn CPR, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. All right. So, yeah, twitter.com slash Steve. If you want to get on there and check it out. And while we're at it, you know, we haven't talked about it in a long time, but we are also on Facebook. So if you want to be friends with us on Facebook, you can search Big Anklevich or Rish Outfield and become our friends. And you can also be a fan of the Steve on Facebook. By way of Twitter and Facebook, you can keep up with us. I tweet and update on Facebook things like I give you a little preview of uh, what the episode is that's coming up. I want to get the episode art put together. I'll stick it on there as a appetizer for you i will also let people know when i've put the bloopers on hit the easter egg so you can go and look for that and and check that out if you're interested in being one of those people that's in the know when it comes to the dune steve check us out on twitter or on facebook i wouldn't bother with myspace we kind of don't bother with myspace nobody bothers with myspace anymore i think the spammers have completely taken over that neighborhood and the decent folk moved away yeah you know, when we were having our problems with the hard drive and losing episodes and stuff, I thought it would be nice if we could just post all the time on dunesteef.com 
letting people know, you know, hey, we're working on the episode. We're going to have another episode. We don't treat the main page as a blog in any way. And I guess now that you're on Twitter, that we won't be posting any kind of messages to the listeners, uh, to the fans, I guess, on the main page, right? Well, funny that you should mention that because I actually had considered that. If people would find that to be interesting, maybe we could start blogging on our page as well. That Would that be something you would want to read or is that something that you could do without? But yeah, let us know. We may uh, see if we can add in a special blog onto uh, the, the site. So, hey, Big, I, I, mean, I know we're out of time and everything. You don't care. Why do you even mention it? Because I was raised right. Uh. Anyway, I, I just thought I'd ask, since I got you here, about the name of our show. Uh, the thing is, when I came up with it, I wasn't aware that 700 other podcasts call themselves Audio Magazine. No, 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 no. It's the, the other part. W- what? Dune Steve? Yeah. I mean, I've heard it so many times, it almost sounds like a normal name to me now. But th- It is a normal name. It's my father's name. Wait, wait I, I met your father. His name was Alejandro. Uh, that's Alejandro. But uh, the man you met is my dad, but not actually my biological father. Oh, so you were... Do you really think one man could have ten children? Well, I mean, if he was just really... Of course not. But my adoptive parents took me and two of my sisters in and treated us just like we were their own. Uh, The Anklaviches didn't have a lot of money, but they had a lot of love. Which reminds me of a story. Wait, 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 wait. My grandpa on my mom's side had like 27 children. You're kidding. Might have been 30, actually. No lie? No lie. Well, hell, we should change the podcast to be named after him. Um, what? That might not work. Why? What was his name? Todd. Todd? Is Todd what? Todd Castle. Oh, Okay, well, uh, let's uh, just move on, all right? All right. 30 kids, really? Yeah. After a couple dozen, he even started reusing names. Okay, now I know you're lying. Dude, I never lie on this podcast. Huh. This is why you don't have a Parsec Award, Rish. All right, so hey, let's just bring this to an end uh, so that we can get the episode up a little sooner. Um, It's still going to be late, but oh well. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, thank you, Barian, for being patient with us or forgetting we exist. <laughs> um, and for sending us a story. To everybody else, you have a good night. Uh, I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Well, I know you want a lover. Let me tell you, brother. She's been sleeping in the devil's bed. That's right. Good night. At the Dune Steve, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like, so if you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, so you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. Take two. Oh, feeling you lovely boy, come on over here. I have some news for you. It turns out that, oh God, someone had to tell you. Oh, well, announce a man. I guess you have to know. Announce a man. He's your real father. Okay, okay, I know how it sounds. But you see, it was a long night of recording. I was lonely. He was there. There was some tequila, I don't know. But after a while... It just kind of got interesting. But that was years ago feeling. I hope you understand. In a colonial home marked with a patina of green mold on cream siding. Ew. Remember feeling. She said. With feeling. She wrote about the fly, right? And many other creatures. Including death. (laughs) 
you get to be the bully. How do you feel? I feel Dirt. strangely empowered. I have an erection. Wait, pecan is what I say, right? Pecan, yeah, pecan. Oh, pecan. No, Kirk. I don't have to go. Eat this, Slick Huggers is. <laughs> All because of pizza? Says Feeling, spitting once more. <laughs> Not on me. No. <laughs> so began the mantra as Feeling's bouncing backpack kelped kibbut kibbut to get within Sorry. Oh, that wasn't what it said? Oh, yeah, you better go back and do that one over then. You know, alliteration is kind of a bugger. <laughs> the only thing Slug feared was his father, not some crazed ass shut in. The only thing. F bug. <laughs> I had to say it, I'm sorry. Feeling reached down and clenched his pouch and the bag he held around his neck. While lingering echoes of verse scattered themselves among autumn leaves. And I'm going to do that last line one more time, just better. Not end. <laughs> <laughs>